I actually want to start <coughs> be way before you move to Hollywood. Okay. I want to go way back to the, the to the dawn of time. Okay. And uh, I, what I'm actually quite curious about, because you have such an interesting range of professional experience and films and televisions and, and things, is did you train formally as a screenwriter? Did you go to film school? Did you go to no, writing? Uh, no, I went to university, then I went to drama school. I went to the Victorian College of the Arts in Melbourne, and I studied acting for three years. And um, I came out of that and got a couple of, for about a year, a couple of acting jobs, and then I didn't. And <laughs> then you I mean got literally <laughs> two. <laughs> <laughs> I got a bit, yeah, it was about that. But I. Um, you know, the, I got, uh, you know, look, I was an out-of-work actor and I was terribly depressed and <laughs> the actors I admired in, in Melbourne were the ones who were creating their own work and writing mm. and getting things on and there are so many wonderful venues in Melbourne. Um, so I started writing um, my own plays um, with John Davies, right. who you know, and we started putting stuff on and in like La Mama, there was that little 40 seat theatre and Napier Street and they had all these great places and so for about the next two years uh, we just performed our own plays and uh, uh, that's how I got into it. Fantastic. And, yeah, and then... Okay. So you made it up as you went along. Yeah, yeah, we just... But you know, it was more fun doing the stuff, the stuff, even the, the acting gigs that we went up for. I mean, they paid money, so they were, they were good when you got them, but actually they were never as fun as the stuff that we wrote because we wrote the stuff we loved doing. And right. So it was just sort of creating our own work. And then I had... Um, I wrote a script that I loved, a film script, and um, I was dating an actress at the time, and she said, send it to um, Rebel Penfold Russell in Sydney, who she had worked with, and... I, um, I sort of packaged it all up in this kind of way and sent it up to Rebel and she, uh, after about two months, contacted me and she said, um, uh, she came to Melbourne and she saw a show and then she said, come up to Sydney, let's talk about what you've written and then she optioned it and then it sort of went from there. And I was with her company that I wrote. Um, Actually, that film never got made. Um, <laughs> as like most passion projects, it, right. they often get you through the door. They're, they're often the hardest things to actually get up. Mm -hmm. But it did get me through the door, and she got me... They were working on this other film, which is Pause. They were trying to find a writer, so I ended up writing that for them. Right. Well, tell me a there. little bit about Pause, because that is a family film, and I think... Um, I remember taking my daughter to see it in the cinema, and she absolutely loved it, but I sort of wasn't sure whether it was a big hit at the time, but like so many family films, it had a very long tail, as they say. Yeah, and, you know, yeah, yeah. It big did, seller it, on DVD and Yeah, it did okay, that. actually. It was, um, but so how did you... Because was that an adaptation? Adaptation of a book, uh, and the author... I uh, absolutely hated the adaptation <laughs> and said, I can't hated remember. Hated your script or hated the film? Uh, or both? Well, both. He just loathed everything about it. But, I mean, it was, <laughs> it was mutual. I read that and went, this is the worst. It was like some dreadful 1950s. Anyway, look, it was... It was um, <laughs> well, no, it so was, tell, it tell was me. No... So, wait, did they... So, this was something Rebel showed you? Or was yeah, no, I mean, look, the book was sweet. It was, it was sweet. It was about a boy and his dog, and um, it just wasn't very sort of... Contempor didn't have much of a contemporary feel and um, stuff. So anyway, that was the idea, and they said, we've optioned it, and we want to do a film about a talking dog, and we'll make a family movie, and they wanted to work with Nathan Cavalieri and um, uh, Billy Connolly, who, you know, did the voice of the dog. So it just sort of went from there. So did you... I, I noticed on IMDb you share a writing credit with Carl Zwicky, who directed yeah, I know. it. How the hell did that happen? <laughs> No, he directed. Um, no, I so think, you didn't um, actually sit down in a room and work on it together? Well, we certainly worked on the story together. And, I mean, I don't know any... Uh, I mean, I wrote the script, but we did the story. And, I, look, I don't know any film where any one person says, I'm responsible for that whole... Right. You know, it's always a collaboration, and uh, directors in particular in particular, collaborate a lot and give a lot to a script and, and mm -hmm. uh, a story. And So, yes, I worked very closely with Carl on that, and then with him on The Magic Pudding, too. Right, right. So... Uh, um, tell me, in fact, with the, the Magic Pudding, was that because it's sort of a very iconic Australian mm -hmm. book and mm -hmm. story and Norman Lindsay and all mm -hmm. of that, were you a little more reverent about that than you were about Paws? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, yes, very much. So I love the Magic Pudding and um, I was thrilled, tickled pink to work on it with um, <laughs> Carmel and, and Jerry, her brother, and, um, and with Carl again because... Um, 
you know, he was great. I loved working with Carl. But it was one of those, it's always very hard um, adapting a, a much loved classic. You are never going to, no one is ever going to say, oh, gee, the film was better than that, you know. <laughs> I mean, no one's ever going to say, you know, Pride and Prejudice was better than the book. Right. It's just it, the best you can hope for is, yeah, they did an all right. Yeah, yeah, also okay. <laughs> did an okay job, you know. So, um, and but again, there was pressure, you know, not pressure, but there we were very cognizant of the fact that it's the book is not written as a movie, obviously, and it, it sort of meanders along. It's a series of adventures. It doesn't have a, a three act structure. It doesn't have a you know driving through line, and and it, you you have to give it that you know mm. you can, to um, so there was sort of you have to make these compromises while at the same time trying to retain the the right. you know, the. Now, I know it's even though our initiative is generally for developing live action films because you've worked on several animated films and they are family films, we're going to talk about animation too uh -huh. a little bit. How was working on Magic Pudding as an animation different as a screenwriter or was it from different from Paws? No, well, no, it was pretty much the no, well, it was different because Paul's, you know, it starts getting made and then, of course, you're on your legs and this is seeing the film getting made and you're, you're working with it. Whereas animation, you're in a room writing, well, talking, writing, and then it's going off to the, to the animators and stuff. So it is a very different process. But, and there was two other writers on The Magic Pudding too, right. but we didn't work. We only actually met. We got nominated for an AFI award. And, we were and that's sitting, when you met. Yeah, we were sitting next to each other. And I was like, oh, you're the, oh, you're the guy who... <laughs> was it, is you're the guy I've been collaborating with for three years. Simon Hopkinson. Uh -huh. yeah, 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 they were lovely. But it was a different form of collaboration to what I'm doing now. It was... Well, it wasn't a form of collaboration. We sort of came on one after the Deterrence, other. Deterrence, right. <laughs> yeah, sort right. of a revolving door. It was like, right. well, he's gone. Yeah. So. Well, tell me, with, with all of your scripts in general, or maybe your process has changed, but what is your process from idea stage through delivery. I mean, different people use whiteboards and cards and scene breakdowns, beat sheets, drafts. What What is your process? Or well, do it's you... changed. And okay. well, thanks tell to me, you, tell a me lot of it, it you <laughs> have um, <laughs> given <laughs> structure in my life. Look, when I started writing, because I was doing plays, um, everything just came from character based. It, the, the thrill of writing plays when we came out of drama school was just actually uh, writing scenarios where people would talk. You loved listening to people talk, and it, it, that's the way it started. And then, so the first few plays and the first movies, that's how I just wrote. And, and then I absolutely, in that drama school way, rejected the idea that I would follow any sort of structure oh, or be for formulaic <laughs> and everything. And then, of course, you find yourself, it becomes ten times the work because, you know, you do have to go back and you do have to um, and I should say that Joan works when I was w doing a romantic comedy for Fox, here, um, uh, uh, Joan was my script editor. Right, we and should actually, divulge that. That Thank was the too. first time <laughs> that someone had sat down and said, look, just stop what you're doing. Just look at the story. These are the, where are your beats? Where is this happening? Where's the first act? And, and even, so that was the first time I embraced the process. And I used structure as a tool. <laughs> I, absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know, the, the thing is, you, you like to think, um, especially when you're starting out, that, you, 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 that originality means not following any sorts of rules. And then, of course, mm. as you write more and more, you realise that originality is understanding the rules and being original within them. It's just mm. there's, the rules are there not because they were made up by Hollywood. They're there because of the nature of human nature. We like certain things in stories we well, like you know to me it isn't so much rules it's tools and yep. and so if a beginning a middle and an end in a story is something you want to call structure that's yeah. just a tool yeah. it's a craft tool you don't have to follow it as a rule but you right. have to know how to use that tool so that then you can bend it to your own will yeah. but and then be as i say be as original as you like within that and with the characters and with the dialogue and i mean that's what i remember from films from great films is is the originality of the character and, and clever dialogue and really terrific dilemmas and characters who go through real change and stuff. But they always generally fall still within that three-act right. structure. So um, it was learning not to fight that and also the eagerness just to write. And it's, there is a real eagerness when you've mm. got an idea just to go straight to your computer and start writing. And 
often you, that fizzles out around page 20 and then it's just <laughs> awfully depressing and you just go, I hate this, I hate this, what was I thinking? And I have learned it is better to actually look at your, is to go through your whole story as a series of beats and know exactly where it's all going mm. and then start writing it. And even if it doesn't work, anyway, it's... It well, was, you can you know. always go back and change it, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. But, but so do you and now, I mean, again, we'll get to the DreamWorks process later because I'm sure they have their own sort of house style process. Yep. But when you're working on your own, and I know you're writing several features mm -hmm. for the Australian yep. industry at the moment, do you use cards? Do you handwrite on cards? Do you have a whiteboard? What, what is your room? You know, I still you resist the cards. I hate <laughs> cards. I, don't, um, I know that you're a big card person. And, um, not a lot so of people are and like sticking them all up. They drive me crazy. I hate them. And um, <laughs> but I do like I like this the computer screen. But what I like doing now is the car. You know, is like this is my uh, one line for this is right. uh, this is how I imagine the film starting. This is the next scene. And then so a beat and, sheet. Really. A beat sheet. That's right. Yeah. Right. And yeah. then and then do you go to scene breakdown where you develop yes. each of those? Yes. Beats and you tend to find as you as each beat starts to evolve, you actually end up starting to write bits of dialogue just as a part of a of that anyway. So you start hearing, feeling the characters' voices and um, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. The thing fun about cards is you don't you don't have that opportunity to you're really just putting up beats and and then moving them around you don't have right. the freedom to then sort of expand upon them and and to get no but it's interesting because i think the freedom that cards gives you is more freedom to move them around whereas once you put them in a word document of course you can cut and paste but the thing i like about cards is you can put a whole movie on your dining table yeah. and you can actually shuffle it like a big deck of cards and say, well, what if that thing that happens over here, we throw it over here? And yeah. There's actually a story, I think it's about Last Days of Shea New, where Gillian Armstrong had put her whole movie in scenes on cards on the dining table and opened a window and it all blew <laughs> and she hadn't numbered them. And, and then where they landed was so much better than where she had originally placed them. It's probably not true, but Well, no, but, but I wish I had a story like that. that. <laughs> That'd be great. Um, I, I can't say my computer blew over and really juggled. But look, it's just, it's whatever works for people. I think it's the way people think. So, you know, right. people, I don't need to see an overview, and, but, but you know, people's mind, other people's minds go to that. So it's really what's mm. best for you. But I do really believe in getting the structure down, first of all, and then fleshing it out and then letting the characters come to life within that structure and then they start to expand and then you can have all the fun with them and, mm -hmm. and just knowing you've got a beginning and a middle and an end is such a relief when you go into it you can actually enjoy it a lot more. So. Mm. Well the other thing I find is that it means you never have to really deal with writer's block because there's always some sort of signpost yeah. about the what's ahead. Yeah, yeah, that's it's true. It's never a blank page. And also the hardest thing is finishing, you know, I mean there's so many things I never finished earlier on, and that's it's, it's the most awful feeling not finishing something. It's a terrible, you feel, uh, it's a bad feeling. And, um, and actually, Mum used to say, not because she was a writer, she's not at all, she's a doctor, but she'd just say, look, just, I don't care if it's shit, just finish it, just get to the end. <laughs> yes. Because she was irritated, and um, because I was in a bad mood, and we weren't even—I wasn't even living with her. But you know, um, but, I, but she was absolutely right. And so I've always gone—you know—that horrible thing. Oh God, this is awful! This is awful! This is terrible! This is, I'm writing the worst thing I've ever done. But at least if you get to the end, then you can go right. Well, I did that, and now I can go back and fix everything. Right. So it was just right. finishing stuff right. was right. the big challenge. So. Right. Absolutely. Um, so let's just go back to pause for a second. Yep. You mentioned that the writer of the book hated your script and hated the movie. How did you, how did you feel about the film? I mean, again, there's no, listen, that... I'm being overly dramatic. Lead. I don't even know what his reaction to the film was. I do remember, because it's one of those things seared into my brain, uh, his comments saying that he hated the, the script, which was it's fine. I would hate if I'd written a book and someone turned it into a, a completely different right. story, which is what we did. Um, I would hate it too. So I, I absolutely understand his response. But from your point of view, the script that you you delivered uh -huh. in those days it was probably an actual printed thing oh it was it was lovely back then you could post it <laughs> yeah, and then you think i've got three days it, you before i get feedback yeah no it was amazing <laughs> that's right before the notes yeah i know coming. now you send it and then you're walking out it's like oh shit i've replied already <laughs> <laughs> but but so. did you do you feel like the film represented the script you wrote 
Yeah, I do. I do, actually. I do. Uh, there's always compromises. It's always budget. It's always that incredible third act battle scene that you've written <laughs> turns into a sort of little scramble across. You know, it, <laughs> all of those things change. But, um, yeah, it, 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 it did. It represented the spirit of it. And, look, that was back before Babe. It was back for animatronics. We really had to... It was just How did whenever you make the, dog, the dog talk. Well, we, we didn't. Whenever he moved his lips, we'd go, we can put a line in there. So when we saw all the footage, his dog would be like, and then Billy Connolly would be like, Look, you know. And so, so uh, you know, he threw in a whole oh bunch my. of stuff. Uh, but, um, and they'd give the dog gum or whatever they gave them to. <laughs> but, but, but nothing could be done CGI. Right. So there was a lot of over the shoulder. <laughs> All his speeches were like, well, listen, son, what I, way I feel. And then when, you, when he was face up, you'd go, yes. And you get like one word thing. So, you know, it was a, ch it was a challenge. Yeah. And I think Babe uh, came out the year later and we went, oh, man, why didn't we do that? <laughs> But, but it was a bigger budget. But so. it's so funny, too, because I remember would take my daughter to it. And, of course, it's that thing about the suspension of disbelief. With kids in particular, I think, if they believe that dog can talk and you've convinced them yeah. of that within the context of the story, it doesn't matter that their lips aren't moving exactly no, the right way. Mind you, kids, these, they're getting, you know, they're onto it now. They really, <laughs> like even technology that's three or four years. Well, I mean, my kids have watched... Lord Pause. of the Rings and oh, yeah. gone and complained about the <gasps> graphics oh, and no. I've gone oh that's fake and I'm like <laughs> Ooh, have you know, they seen Pause? Oh, no I haven't even shown them Pause I'm terrified <laughs> are you ashamed? no I'm not ashamed I actually like Pause it was a really sweet film it had a really good heart and it was it was funny and it was it, Billy Connolly brought a lovely irreverence to it. Mm. I mean, Pause is something I'm very proud of as a, mm. as a little Australian film. I thought yeah, it was, I watched it recently. And it was it Sandy Gore up. as the villainess, and she mm. was, you know, it, it, it had quirky stuff, and it, but it was small, and it, was, it sat where it, it did well where it sat in the marketplace, but it was never going to be a gigantic, no. you know. But it's interesting because I watched it just recently and unlike so many Australian films and family films, it's urban. It's set yeah. in, yeah, in yeah. inner Sydney yeah, we're in and it we're looks in like it. Yeah, and you know, with the terrace houses and yeah, the yeah. old Harold it was Park. Fun. Or yeah, which, the Greyhound Racing yeah, Park and, and stuff. It's, and it's, but the interesting thing is that to me it's still quintessentially Australian mm. and the, partly it's the, the performances but really there's something about the storytelling. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. No, it was a nice film thank you that was good how many drafts did you do oh i i, I don't remember but it's it's always you know between 15 and 20 by the time mm. you're going and then it's a whole you know on the fly it's a whole bunch of new stuff right. i think really i've never it's always beyond 10 by the time people start thinking about um well this will be uh, something that will green light and right. and i mean they call it a first and second draft, but it's never really that, of course. Right. It's really a third and a seventh draft that they're talking about. So, right. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, I think, I think that's one thing that some <coughs> writers and producers in this country sometimes, because the funding agencies generally can't fund more than three drafts or so, uh -huh. Uh, you know, the the danger is that films go into production before the scripts are ready. Right. And oh, for better or worse, we're in a situation where writers just, if you want to get a movie made, you're going to have to put out and yeah. you're going to have to do a lot of unpaid work. That's yeah. just the way it is. Yeah. And we're incredibly lucky to get those three drafts worth of funding. So thanks, Sally. That, yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's the same. I have to say that's the same in America. It's the same in Hollywood. It's like it's always, you know, you've got your job, now write your spec. Mm. It's, you have to do the work for free, right. even when you're, you know... So, but yeah. you know, it's the, the free, when you're doing it for nothing, it's kind of good in a way because you're writing what you love and that's right. the best, you know, it's always nice to have a script that you are writing just for love mm. and that's the one that's never, you're never going to be paid for until it gets made. Right. I know so. which one you're talking about. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. on to your move to LA. Yeah. Um, how did you get in the door at DreamWorks? Okay, well, I started before, well, before DreamWorks, so I was with Rebel and Leighton Image and their production company doing um, uh, Pause, and then I was doing with, uh, with Energy, I was doing Magic Pudding, and then at that point, Fox Studios was set up, and they were setting up a division, and they, I, I, I sent in uh, sample scripts to the head of development, and 
he brought me in for a meeting and ended up putting me under a contract at Fox here mm. to develop some things and we developed a TV show. We sold a bunch of pilots to local networks here. And then what happened was he went over to Los Angeles. He was accepted, given a job at Fox in Los Angeles. And when he went over, he brought my contract over oh. to LA for a year. So for a year, I was under contract to Fox and Regency in LA to develop pilots. And then I was there uh, doing that for about, uh, about five years. I was in Los Angeles and I would sell uh, 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 I would sell a pilot script every year to a network or a studio and, um, and they never went anywhere. Because, actually, what I, I wrote two things that I'm enormously proud of that have never been made, and, but I really loved them and they were passion projects that I loved and those two scripts got me in the door of Fox and then got me in the, every door in LA mm. and then I would sell a pilot, they'd say, those, we love those ideas, but we, we can't make those, it's, not, it's too weird for this, or it's too edgy, it's whatever, but we love the way you write. Can you write, come up with something else? And so I'd come up with ideas and I'd sell, they'd say, great, write the pilot, and it would never go anywhere. After six years, and they'd go, why isn't it, why isn't it as good as those two scripts you came in with? <laughs> and I'd say, well, because, that's because it, you know, I didn't come in with an idea about a dysfunctional family that every other network's making a pilot about. You know, I came in with something... Anyway, it didn't work, and then I got... Um, was that when you were driving the truck that had the window that wouldn't close? I yeah, well, was, yeah, I, I did hit a the... bit of an all-time low, especially in 2008, <laughs> the writer's strike hit, and I lost a huge deal. Anyway, I got very unhappy and depressed again, and uh, mercifully met my, uh, uh, my, the woman who had become my wife, and she just said, look, come to New York, it's just too horrible here. And so I went to New York for three years, and... That's when everything changed, and that's when she went through all my stuff, old scripts, and the stuff that I had loved, and she said, who is looking at this and who's not? And she had connections, and she said, well, the wrong people are reading your things. Can, can I and, ask um, you, at that point, did you have an agent in I, LA I or had, a manager? I had, I, yeah, I'd, had, I'd gone in there, I had ICM, and the, my agent got fired, then I was with UTA, and he was doing nothing, and I fired him, and the relief, you could hear his relief over the phone. He's like, oh, that's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> they were so happy to get rid of me, and then I, got, I went to LA with no, uh, New York with nothing, and then my current wife got me all this through her connections. Got all, a lot of my the, the scripts that I had always loved, seen by people. I got a new agent, and that's when I got into DreamWorks, and that's when it, that started. Right. So, so what was your when when you got into the door at DreamWorks? Was that based? Did they buy or option one of your? That was scripts? A, that was a stroke of luck. Absolutely, it was one of those things where I, I had a new agent, and they said we're going to send you out as just a go see around to studios. And I went into DreamWorks, and there was a young studio executive called Amy, and she went, "Oh, you're Australian. That's funny because we're looking for an Australian movie." And they'd been talking to other writers about, and they'd been kicking around other Australian ideas. They wanted something, you know, like Kung Fu Pan. It was China, and they they wanted. You know, we want something in Australia. And I said, well, that's funny you should say that because I had this idea about something that I've ever had ever since I was a little kid growing up on the beaches, and it was a thing about birds and uh, people. And she went, um, oh, that's great. How would you feel if the people were animals, but we kept your birds? And I went, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you know, whatever. Yeah, I said, of course. And so the, I, well, I sort of went in with half the idea, and then she said, what if we were to help flesh out that into the other half. And then that began a collaboration just with her. And then to, to work up a pitch that I then pitched six times to various different so levels. This, was this Larrikins? Yes. Okay. And so this was, so the first thing was a conversation and then there was a pitch and then I had to pitch it to her boss and then his boss and then his boss and then his boss all the way up the ladder. And I was in New York, I was, you know, I was going broke flying back to LA to keep doing these pitches. But finally, and I remember we were going out to the theatre in New York one night, they finally called and said, yeah, we're going ahead with it. And I thought, oh, this is lovely, this is, I'm going to get a film made, you know, and that was 2011, and it's taken, it, we're now 2016, and we're, we're two years off release, so it, it takes been, a long it's time. It's been shot, right? Or you, because you recently had a test screen. <coughs> no, but what they do in animation is, um, once you get to that level where they're happy with the script, and that takes several years, or the board artists come in and they draw the pictures, every individual scene, so you end up with a flip 
the virtual thing of a flip chart, but it's about 130,000 pan panels, and then that is screened. So it's, you see the entire right. movie as a very rough, drawn black and white version, and you'll go, that's working, that's not, whatever. And then you go back to the script. In the early screenings, you go straight back to the script and you, you, you redo a lot of it, and then three months later you'll see it again. And that's what we just had, it was our second screening. And so we're now at the phase where it's like, all right, let's start rolling certain sequences forward into production. So they'll go into something called layout and they'll eventually go into, which layout is just very robotic and then they'll go into animation where they they've already designed all the characters, you know, which they do the, from the skeleton up with the muscles so that you, they can work every... And so certain sequences will, start, will move forward now and others will go back. So our third screening is in June and that will be some black and white stuff, but you'll start to see some very robotic stuff. And you end up, I guess, with maybe 10 screenings uh, before the film comes out. Right. Fascinating. So it's a long, it's a so long it, haul. So it's basically seven years from the time they decided to go ahead and do it. Uh, well, yes, but I would say it's more about, uh, yeah, but there's a lot of development and stuff. It's more probably four years. Of from the, When they really commit to it, it's right. probably four years. So in those early stages when you were pitching, how developed was the story in your head? Had you written a 30-page treatment? or had No, you I've always, um, the way I pitch is is that I write out, I do uh, about a 10 minute pitch, and I don't have That's it. a verbal, you yes, stand Yes, and I write the entire thing out as if I'm telling a friend at a dinner party a story. And so it's all colloquial, and I memorize the whole thing, and then I go with no notes. And that has been the most effective approach in Hollywood, because they, unlike in England and stuff, where they just want to read something, and in Hollywood, they like, to invest in the person in the room and they're very, very big on the pitch process and mm. it makes all the difference in the world if you're a good pitcher and it has nothing to do with how good a writer you are. It's, it's not a fair system, right. but if you can go in and really deliver a great pitch and have people like you mm. and like your story, you stand a much better chance. Wow. And so that's what I would always do and I've never gone back to notes again. And right. it's, it's, I would absolutely recommend it. Right. Uh, Interesting. To, to, you know, and, yeah. So once they, so they optioned Larrikins uh -huh. on the basis of a verbal pitch. Yep. Fabulous. And at that point, did they commission a full draft or did they commission they, a, uh, they, I was quite a beat sheet fortunate or? in the sense that they enjoyed the pitch so much and it was so detailed, they said go straight to script. They don't normally do that. They normally go straight to go to treatment and then go to script. But they said, look, the pitch is very thorough, so let's go straight to script. So then I went to script and it was a year on that. And at that point, that's when they brought in Tim Minchin. They were looking for directors and they certainly wanted Tim involved because they wanted them to be a musical. And Did they also need him to be Australian, or was that no, just coincidental? That, that, listen, they had a separate thing with Tim. They wanted, they'd seen Matilda, they wanted to be in business with him, and they were big fans of his, and uh, he, they gave him a bunch of scripts to read, and he <laughs> responded to Larrikins because it was a, an Australian story. And so they set up a meeting with him, me and Tim, and we got on well, and, and he came you know, on board as director, and there is a co-director who's the uh, and a big animation director who because it's also very technical mm -hmm. so there's tim and chris who's the co-directors and tim's doing the music for it too right um was there at any point when you were working in those early stages with dreamworks was there any point where they you felt like their your australianness was either like an advantage or was holding you back or for this project yeah oh, it was an, well they wanted an Australian movie so it was absolutely an advantage right. I mean you know I think a lot but, of the but I mean they could have it's like the red dog thing you know they could have said yeah we love this but set it in Hawaii or... no they wanted listen they you know they love Australia and they want that world and they want to do that world in the in the same way they did China for Kung Fu Panda they want to right. really and they have these incredible artists that they gather from a lot of these European art schools and way, the way they do it is they, they start out by doing these incredible huge big paintings of the Australian outback but sort of with a slightly because it's a 
animated movie, it's never quite realistic. It's like it's heightened, but really magnificent. And what they focus on a lot is the colours and the and the shapes of the outback, and they capture the sense of the great age of the ape. Uh, you know how the outback feels. It's, I mean, it's r extraordinary what they do. Is, are, are, have they remained, or have you and them remained authentic? In other words, yeah. you haven't made up an animal that doesn't exist. No, in Australia. we have not. We've got every cliche animal <laughs> in the book. They're hopping around there, but we. Um, but they're they're beautiful and the designs of them are incredible and uh, and no we actually have remained very loyal and true to the to the story and to um, to exploring the indige indigenous culture and to being very respectful of that I, I, I know that a big part of the music uh, the not Tim songs but a lot of the soundtrack is that they have indigenous artists working on a lot of so it's it is a really it's a grand sweeping Australian epic and and so far it's it's been you know make the movie that you want to make and make it Australian and right. and they've been very good about that right. so yeah um, I know you've also had some interesting meetings with some of the executives. Well, yeah. I, I mean, mean yes. and, and I, I would imagine sometimes their notes can be challenging. Yeah, well, okay, so well, the upside is, <laughs> you know, it's all, it's incredibly supportive, and it is, and the collaborative process is, is great because they put you with people that you choose. So every screening we get the sort of, they call them movie buddies, but it's really very good people in the industry. And so all of that's great. I mean, within a big studio, it is you you bump up against the politics and you you bump up against the the money and you know it's and so when things don't go necessarily as planned, you just I mean look the up <laughs> yeah I've had What's some I've had some awful me I've had some some absolutely dreadful dreadful things said to me in rooms <laughs> that I I wouldn't repeat and. Um, and but it didn't, they didn't break your spirit? They did at the time. <laughs> I honestly, uh, you know, I'm dreadfully ashamed. I, I wept after, <laughs> I cried in my office. But, and I, I haven't done that for, you know, I don't know. But I was that upset. And I was more, it was actually because I was angry as well. And, but, you know, you just have to, that is a small part of it. And what you do learn is, you have to sort of roll with the punches in that world and you have to, even if you don't want to, you have to understand the politics and you cannot be sensitive and you do also have to understand that it is a, it is a business and there is a lot of money mm -hmm. and a lot of jobs and so when you are feeling like this is not my creative vision, it is always good to push for that, and actually Tim's especially good at pushing for that. But at the same time, you do have to remember that from from their point of view, you know, it, it represents a great deal of money. And um, well, it's I mean, we're talking about a couple hundred million, right? Look, I don't know the exact budgets when they come out, but yes, they're they're high end of the so market. So by the they're time up there they with pay for prints and, and advertising, it's it's huge. easily a and quarter what, of a billion dollars they, that they've invested. Well, well, what look as I say, I honestly don't know the figures, but it's 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 right up there with everything else, like like the superhero stuff. But so the you know the potential is that a lot of money comes in. So look at that level. There's always going to you can't get upset when someone you know, is mean to you, <laughs> over, you <laughs> over your latte. It's just like, um, but... Uh, so do you think that's made you a better writer or just uh, given you a thicker skin? Look, it has made me a different writer. In that environment, I'm very fast because that's the way they like it done. I'm very, leave my ego out the door. I'm very open to ideas and everyone's ideas and I do that. And But, there, but what is really great is having stuff back here to write, which is just stuff that you love writing. And, it's, um, and I do love writing larrikins, but I have been rewriting a cartoon for five years when, at the end of the day. And, and we'll probably be doing it for the next two years. And so you do, uh, for your own sanity as a writer, you need to have projects that you love that are just, that no one's, um, you know, leaning over your shoulder. With, right. Uh, tell me, they, I guess it was once you had been commissioned to write Larrikins mm -hmm. that you got involved with Kung Fu Panda 3. Yep. 
So, so what happened was the two writers, happened. well, there were two writers who do Kung Fu Panda 3, John and Glenn, who were very talented, obviously, and they went off to do something else while Kung Fu Panda 3 was being written. So for about three months, and this was the period just before Larrikins, it had sort of developed to the point where they liked it, but there was a bit of a gap before they sort of started moving forward. So they put me on Kung Fu Panda for about four months. That's when someone was mean to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it was like, and I was yeah. like, well, you know, who, who thought it would be a good idea for me to write uh, for Kung Fu Panda? You know, I mean, how many different ways can you write awesome? Or, you know, it's just, it's like I'm, I'm not 22 and tapped into the American, you know. Well, I read so, an interview with Jack Black where he said it's actually The Revenant, but animated for children. <laughs> the story. It so is. why couldn't you do that? It's a wonderful story and stuff. And um, I really enjoyed working on it. The people were lovely, but it's, it, it's, it wasn't my strength. It just wasn't something. Why I, not? What was so different about it's, it? Because it's 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 very it's a it's a very young American voice. It's 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 in younger than Larrikins will be. Yeah, no, Larrikins is it's um, it's Australian. It really is an Australian voice. I'm totally comfortable writing all of the Larrikins. Right. You know, it, there's a. I mean, when Tim and I, you find your accent even gets more Australian just being in a room <laughs> with Australians, and all the actors are Australian and the stuff, and so right. we're, we're tapped into that, but. The, and I don't. I like writing American stuff, but that particular one, it wasn't. It wasn't. To be honest, it wasn't even. There was a lot of stuff that I did on that that was terrific. It was more sort of tapping into the voices. I, I think it wasn't. It just, look. It just wasn't my my forte. Mm. But um, mercifully, the two proper writers came back, and <laughs> I went off onto Larrikins. Um, can you tell me one of the things, and I think you and I have talked about this before, the idea that, and I think it sort of started with Shrek, this idea that you, that the script is uh, multiple levels of jokes yep. and gimmicks, and yep. there's adult jokes that yep. completely go over the heads of the kids, yep. and there's stuff for the kids. Which, again, is, is a sort of classic four quadrant, right? We're going to satisfy everyone with actually separate jokes, not just all the same jokes. Yep. Is there, do they have, does DreamWorks have a formula? Because they've done it with Shrek, Madagascar, How to Train Your Dragon, Kung Fu Panda, and I presume with Larry No, they, look, they don't have a, a, a formula about that. And everyone thinks that studios come at you with this, you know, but they, they don't. They really, they don't want it to be like Shrek. They're not, they, they don't want it to be sort of pop culture references. They don't want Larrikins to be that. They don't want, what they want with Larrikins is something, look, everyone in Hollywood w wants something that is unique. And you can't just put out the same formula for every movie. And so what they really, which has been the great thing about working in Larrikins, they really are, they want to hear that Australian voice. They want that irreverence. They want all of those things we were talking about before, because that's, that's fresh. It's mm -hmm. never been done at right. that level for them. And um, so that's what they're looking for. They're not saying make this Kung Fu Panda or How right. to Train Your Dragon or any of those things. Is there, do you then consciously, uh, knowing that you're aiming for a very wide market, do you include animal characters who are like the parents or the grown-ups, like in Nemo? It's, it's yeah, very much yeah. the story of yeah. a father have, and son. We have so, his parents, yeah. So with you, the, is, it, is it about some of those relationships? It is, it is. It's more about, um, it's, we can't actually talk about the whole thing, but it's, it's actually the, the biggest thing yeah, is what about... What can you tell us? <laughs> well, it's a, tell us everything it's Friendship. Again. It's about, but uh, there's a very Australian, particularly uh, Aussie friendship between guys and stuff, and that is a big theme, um. and it's a very interesting one because Australian men aren't known for being particularly, uh, you know, open with their. <laughs> so it's it's a lot about um, about what it means to, you know, be a friend and how much you care or don't care and that sort of thing. These are some of the themes. They're not all of them. There are parents. There are other, you know, things. But that is a, that's one that I find particularly appealing. And it's a musical, you know, and I, I don't think there's been a musical about guys and their friendships. <laughs> <laughs> um, in Australia, about, and so that's a big part of our of our film, and uh, it's really mm. one of the most fun parts of it because it's it's not something right. we've seen a lot. I mean, it's it's not Frozen, put it that way. You know? Right, right. <laughs> um, now, have you? Is it cast? Yep. You're all cast. Yep. So, do you write? Do you rewrite for casting? Well, what happens when they? Yeah. Well, 
they come in, the actors, one of, you know, and they go into the booth and they do it and they, what they're encouraged to do is to, to contribute if they want and you'll find the first few sessions they'll be very, you know, they'll stick exactly to the script and, and because they're, you know, they're trying to do the right thing but uh, when they get more relaxed with the character you'll find that they'll improvise a lot and I think that's where a lot of the, when you see a lot of those very good animated movies, a lot of the throwaway dialogue and stuff is is often what's what's most entertaining and it's uh, mm. anyway so hopefully they bring some of themselves to it so we've only just started that we've just started mm. recording the main cast you know exciting um i once when you and i were skyping i saw your your whiteboard yeah. which did have a three-act structure thing but then you also had the character roller coaster arc thing uh, and i don't know how you can even read all of that is that a sort of a, 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 a schematic of your own devising, or no. is that a DreamWorks house I don't know. Schematic? I don't know who put that on the board. I didn't do that. I hate that. I mean, they get up there with bits of yarn, and oh my God, you know, there's <laughs> red strands of wool going everywhere, and it ends up with this sort of macrame thing of emotional arcs behind you, and it's like, what the hell is that? But it does, but again, some people look at that and go, I get it. I get where the film's, where, where, where we're dropping out, because look, all the red wool is not there, you know. <laughs> so if that's the way they see it, that's absolutely fine. So it's, you don't find I don't, you use that at all? I don't see it like all. that, no. no not right. for me, but, you know, right. you know, if it works for you, it works for you. Right. Uh, tell me, I know this morning um, Seth was talking a little bit about merchandising uh -huh. and all of that, and of course it supports the industry when it comes to animated films and family films. I assume that, that sort of developing Larrikin's toys in your Bilby character or whoever your other animal characters is. It, have you been working with toy designers and that's not yet, thing? but we will. Certainly, that's a big part of it. They all, you know, it all it, that that will all start rolling in sooner rather than later. They like to get it all sorted and ready and to go. And as the writer, do you get a piece of that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm dreadful with contracts. I haven't read. Um, but I don't know, to be honest. But yeah, it's a big pass, obviously. That's where they make a lot of money with all their plush mm. toys and their McHappy yeah. meals. So yeah. there'll be a lot of bilbies sitting on Big Macs, I guess. <laughs> well, if we're lucky, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, do you... Do you ever, have you ever relied on writing manuals like Sid Field, McKee, Christopher Vogler, any of those? No. Do you Again, for the same reason I never liked structure, I never liked thinking that was what writing was about. And that's more, that's not a flaw in them, but it's actually more a flaw in me because I, I, I look at things now, at the, you know, I look at films that they use like Chinatown and stuff and I go, what a beautifully constructed movie and, and then that's an example in that book. And I, you know, I, 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 I should read books like that. I chose not to um, because I was being a snob, but, but you know, uh, but I should have and I, you know. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is also, I, no, I wasn't just being a snob. The, the only reason I sort of survived in Hollywood over the last 10 years and kept on working was not, was because I, I wrote my own stuff and the only stuff that people loved was the stuff that I actually came in that was completely untouched by any Hollywood formula or anything like that. And it was the one lesson over, well, there's a lot of lessons, but I mean the big lesson for the last 10 years was all you've got, your best hope in that industry is just to write what you are passionate about and not try to find it. There are so many people in Hollywood galloping after the, what is working and out there. And they always give me scripts to read and they're always a crime thriller set in LA and there's some beautiful <laughs> broad, you know, and she's murdered and some, you know, there's always a hooker in a hotel room dead. And, you know, it's just like, oh my God, how many times have, but that's, they're going, you know, this is what's going to sell, and it's like, it doesn't sell. What, would, what sells, what they really want over there is a fresh voice. And they may take it and bend it to their will, and you can be exploited, or, you know, and whatever, and buy a house in the hills, but <laughs> what will get you in the door is, is your passion and your originality, not trying to follow anything, and that's the reason I, I didn't read those books, because I didn't want to start trying to write Cool. A Hollywood movie. So. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Now we have time for questions. Um, yeah, yeah. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> Some questions. Anyone? Yes. Just you know, whoever has their hand up. Thank you. Hi. Um, I just had a question. I consider myself uh, a writer and an actor, and you mentioned that you got into writing to create 
your own work. As you've gained more success as a writer, have you completely abandoned your dream of acting, or does that still sort of have a place in your heart where you sort of still try and nurture that? Yeah, it sounds so brutal when you say it like that. It's, it's, it's absolutely the truth. Hey, it's I, 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 no, no, I, 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 dream, I loved acting more than anything. I loved being on stage more than anything. It was the best feeling. But, and I still try, I still try to get jobs on larrikins and I can't, there's 72 talking animals, I can't get one of them. <laughs> and um, we do, I do scratch, which is, you know, scratch is when you've got to do the voices because you can't have the actors all the time, so you always, you know, and I love it. But I, I, um, I do dream that one day I will write something and do it, but I don't think it's going to happen in the next two years. But I would never recommend giving up on that as a dream. Write stuff and that perform in it and that's... You know, I th that's what I would do next if I could. Yeah. Oh, hi. Uh, just wondering, uh, at what point did um, the decision uh, get made to make Larrikins into a musical? Was it part of your original conception? No, it wasn't part of my original thing. We wrote the script and I think it was a trend that was happening and I think... Um, in, in Hollywood, and I think it naturally lent itself to a musical. I mean, a lot of animated movies are musicals, even if they're just one or two songs. You'll often find in an animated movie there's a song. Um, like in Lion King, I think there's about three or four. So they, it's always in the back of their mind when they're making an animated movie, because kids love music. And I think the fact also that they really wanted to work with Tim, and he was Australian, I think that was a, a, a big factor in bringing it together. But it's added an enormous amount. Uh, I mean, because Tim's music is so funny and so irreverent and so Australian, you know, it just brings out this whole new layer to the film. So it was... No, the story never changed. The story is pretty much exactly what I pitched in the room when I first went in, but it really has given a lot of depth and a lot more humour to it and a lot more power. You know, songs at their best, you know, just can be so much more powerful in, in, in showing a character's emotion and that sort of stuff. So, and he's, it's very funny. His songs are hilarious. So. <laughs> oh, sorry, I thought I was choosing. Uh, just you. Um, I was just interested in the fact that you didn't study screenwriting, don't read the books, you don't use wool. Um, <laughs> it, as far as your writing goes then, is that quite, do you find that, are you thinking in the three structures when you're talking about features or are you just writing quite instinctually as to what feels like the right um, step and, and it gains its, its own momentum story-wise? I, I do, I think absolutely in, in three-act structure now and um, I'm always thinking when I'm writing something, you know, around page 20, you know, you need, you need a big turning point in here and this is what, so I do think that way now. And I, even though I didn't read those books, I'm more familiar with that, I mean, I, it, having worked sort of for 10 years doing it, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm, I'm very conscious of the, of the structure and the, the form and the rules and everything. And also, I had the, when I work with people like Joan, they're, they're the ones who sort of, who, Joan has been the book, you know, that, that I refuse to read. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but, the my epitaph. but I would not be doing what I'm doing, honestly, if I had not worked with someone like Joan, uh, with, or specifically with Joan. So. But again, I think it's, it's just always so important. I think people who are wary of those books and everything, and I am too, they see them as prescriptive and they should not be. They are just tools for you to access if you want them. And I actually often find those, those books are useful as diagnostic tools rather than creative tools. So you write a few drafts and then you go and look and say, oh, that's interesting. I guess that's why that feels right where it is, because that's really hitting right where these guys say it should hit. And then if something doesn't feel right, it's like, oh, wow, look, that's about 20 pages too late. So yeah. it, there are all different ways to use those tools, but they're not meant to be followed religiously. Yeah, and by the way, I mean, do all the script writing courses too and read all the books. I mean, the thing is, anything that you can do to immerse yourself in it, and it's like, you know, the reason I wanted to write and not stop acting was because I, I just couldn't act, you know, on my own. If something doesn't give you a job, you just in front of a mirror going, <laughs> doing Shakespeare. It's just like it's the saddest thing you've ever seen. But at least with writing, you can sit in a room and you can write and write. And just to, to, to be able to do something you love all the time is, is just such a great luxury. And that was the thrill of writing. And that's to expose yourself to other writers by going to courses, to read about other writers is a wonderful thing. It was just something I didn't choose to do. But I would, anything you can do to be more immersed in that and to be practicing your skill the whole time is a really great thing. 
more questions? Do we have a, a roving mic we can pass around? Thank you. Uh, hi, Harry. Hello. <laughs> um, Harry, given that you've crossed over between animation and live action quite a lot, yep. um, do you think, particularly in the family genre, that there are different rules that apply to the two um, styles of filmmaking, or the same? Yeah. Well, um Look, there's a lot of similarities. With animation, you step much more into a surreal world. You, you really, even when you're in the real world, they will push it into a, an area that is not real. It's, the whole point of animation is not to be so good it recreates real life. It's actually to, to make the world a difference. So even you know, the images of Australia and everything, it won't be an, an exact uh, replication of a, a replica of Australia, it will be an animation view of it. So, so it does become a much bigger uh, th thing. But well, but within that, you still want your characters to be very as real and as grounded and as complex and as funny as in a as in in a in a family movie. It's just, it's it's. I don't I don't know actually which I prefer. It's, the animation has been wonderful, but uh, it would be great to go back and do a, a real live, uh, you know, live action one, I think. Where were we? I think this gentleman. Hi, Harry. I've got Hello. a throwaway question for you first. Yep. Okay. So next year when Larrikin's released, you're going to be an overnight success. <laughs> Well, not next year, 2018, okay, February. Two years away. <laughs> two years to be an overnight success. That's right. Um, a, a simple question, then perhaps a more de detailed one. Um, do you tend to find, because you've mentioned that you know you couldn't get an acting job while you're doing this writing, um, and to be honest, I'd cast you straight away. You're one of the few guys <laughs> I see you. that actually just goes, I can see so much, and I've got roles. <laughs> do, do you tend to find in the US that you get vertical tasks rather than multi hats? Sorry, can, uh, well, how do, you do you find that people sort of go, oh, you're a writer, you, you know, we won't put you in the acting, or you're a director, we won't yeah, give you that, cinematography? Yeah, that happened in Australia too, I have to say. Yes, they, okay. they look at the writer and go, this is your writer, um, but that was absolutely happening before I went to America. Right. I do think they like to keep the writer in particularly separate. They, they're, they're wary of writers that want to do too much. Um, on, on, on books and things, I'm totally with you. I've yep. never read one. I've won six Best Film Awards and I've right. had a couple of feature screen accounts. Right. I'm never going to read a book. Okay. I don't read other people's scripts. If they've been produced, I'll read, work with a writer. So you, we're on the same page <laughs> there. So keep with it. Um, look, a vast majority of the um, films that have been mentioned today uh -huh. um, have been adapted from books, mm -hmm. other than Larrikins, it seems. Um, <laughs> so maybe my question's down into the, um, the, the smaller part, but what hope is there for original creations um, or is pre-marketing, or do you feel that the pre-marketing is really necessary? Well, everyone loves a book, everyone loves a proof of a story before they move into it. I mean, adapting a book is, uh, adapting a popular book is, is easy because you, you bring an audience into it. Uh, but that said, uh, most of the time I've never, Whenever I've gone into a room, they've always asked for original ideas, and most of the success I've had selling anything is an original idea. In fact, I've never gone in and said, I want to adapt this book. I've had people come and say, would you adapt this book? But um, again, particularly in Hollywood, but I think also here, what they really want is originality. Okay, and flicking off from that, do you find when many people give you notes, they want to put their own mark in your script? Yeah, uh, there's people who are, there are great, people who give great notes and there are people who give dreadful notes and the people who give great notes understand the story you're trying to tell and give notes that, that push you to making a better version of that story. The people who don't give great notes are the ones who say, you know what we could do with this? We could also go, you know, they take you in a different direction and that is a really dangerous, there are so many people who give notes in Hollywood, you just have to be very cautious about, which is why they have this good system in place where you actually get like three buddies, you don't get swamped and uh, people you trust to help you make the movie you want to make. I actually found a technique was to put in a couple of dummy scenes that I knew were going to get deleted <laughs> so that they're focused on, we've got to delete this and you can argue about that and the rest of the story stays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'll try that one. <laughs> I, I think we're about at the end of this session. We're okay. going to have to take a break. But thank you so much, Harry. My pleasure. Thank you very thank much, you. everyone. Thank you. Thank you.